Hey everyone, Mike here. Welcome to episode 60 of the Around the Crease podcast. This week we have a very special guest, Coach Chris Garland of Detroit Country Day in Michigan. He is with us this week because he wanted to talk a little bit about recruiting in general and from, from his perspective, how it affects players and parents and some of the things they should and should not be doing. So we're going to get into it right now. So I'm here with my, as usual, my co-host Michael Ward and the Midwest contributor for uh, LaxRecords.com. But we also have a very special guest with us tonight, Coach Chris Garland, the head coach at Detroit Country Day in Michigan. Coach, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Thanks Mike and Mike. Appreciate being on. All right. Uh, so let's have some fun. We're, so we're, yeah, we're, talk to you. we're definitely going to have some fun today. So uh, we're going to end up talking a little bit about kind of the the Midwest and some of the teams and. Uh, players and stuff like that. We're going to do that towards the end, but I think we're going to get into something probably a little bit juicier, probably something people will be interested in, in hearing, um, and that's recruiting. And uh, you have a pretty, I guess, a fairly unique perspective on it a- as well because um, you're you're from the East Coast as well, or you came from the East Coast. Um, so you kind of have that, that dual perspective on it as well. So why don't you kind of kick us off and tell us, like, what you see as far as uh, the recruiting landscape, your general – thoughts oh wow there's there's, uh i think a lot of misconceptions and confusion in uh the recruiting landscape right i think um you know kids are doing things kids and families are doing things that i I find quizzical at times uh they spend a lot of money they shouldn't spend uh, and their searches aren't narrowly tailored and they're not really thinking through what's in the best interest of their son or daughter as I was telling you earlier, our philosophy just with at Country Day and for the Juice Cherries, college is a match to be made, not a prize to be won. For us, whether it's at Country Day or the Juice Cherries, if a kid's going and play at Joey Kamen, she's going to Loyola. That's great for Joey. He's yeah. a great kid, great cross player. We have a young man who's going to Lindenwood, Trevor Lockwood. He's a great ball player, great kid, great family. And Trevor made his decision that's different from Joey, and he made the best decision for himself and his family. And can't fault Trevor, who could have played a lot of other places, but it was the best opportunity for him. And he was really excited about the program at Lindenwood. They have a great coaching staff, and it, it made the most sense for him. So yeah. for, for the kids in our program, we always tell them to think about what makes the most sense for you and your family. And the one thing people don't think about, guys, is cost. They never really sit down and think about what is this actually going to cost us. Yeah. And, you know, we tell people to do the net price calculator and do well in school. Those things will help reduce the cost of college. But also, if that's a concern for you, then we could figure out which schools would be best for you as opposed to, well, I want to go to this potentially Division three school. Oh, that may not be the best fit for you. It may not be the best fit for your family financially. It may not be a school that you're interested in. And you may end up being back home in Michigan, whereas you go to Davenport, which could be a great fit for you. They're going to be Division two. They have money for kids. They'll have soon have money for kids. Could be a better opportunity for you, yeah. right? And it's your journey. It's not your parents' journey, even though they're paying for it. This is your journey as a student athlete. So yeah. you've got to make a decision. And one of the things I think I learned, I was a college counselor at St. Paul Schools in Baltimore. And um, I, I always would ask my supervisor, what if we make the wrong decision? And he said, kids change. You know, they change. They can go to school and not like it, and it's not on you. You've given the best advice possible at that moment in time. So that's always kind of my guiding light. We've given them the best advice possible, and they could change, and that's okay. Right. Well, you, you said uh, parents do a lot of quizzical things. Like, why do you think parents do some of those things? Like, what do you think the driving force is? I mean, I know everybody wants to live the D1 dream, but is that really it? I think it's fear of missing out. Well, we, we have to go to the prospect day at this Division one school, we have to go to these events when in reality they're not a good fit. We we always get them. And Mike knows it's about me. If you if it's close, if it's affordable, and it's it's not a burden on your family, go to a prospect at a Division one school. See what that feels like, and you walk away saying, "Was I the best guy there?" And if you can't say that, okay, then then the decision's been made for you. Yeah. But there's nothing wrong with going. To, uh, for example, Coach Connery, uh, he's a great person, great great guy. Enjoy talking to him. And we tell our guys, hey, go check it out. It's close. It's affordable. You know, you don't have to pay for a flight. You don't have to stay in a hotel. Go. It'll be competitive. You'll get coached up. There's nothing wrong with that, you know? So I think parents end up doing things that don't make a lot of financial sense sometimes. 
um, and can eventually like, maybe hurt their son a lot. You know, that's what I always say. Don't hurt your son or yeah. daughter. Right. Yeah. So, you know, when, when you're talking, I mean, you've talked a little bit about some of the things, but when you're talking to kids, like, how do you, because, you know, one of the things whenever I talk to kids and, you know, maybe it's some of that, like when I've talked to kids in the past, as far as, you know, they see all their friends, you know, and teammates on club teams and high school teams are all going D1. They're committing. And, you know, in previous years, some of these kids were committing during their sophomore year, the summer of their sophomore year. They were already making the decisions. And I talked to a lot of kids. They were like, well, I made my choice because everybody else was committing. And I thought I wanted to go to UNC and they had like one spot left, you know, and so they were like, if I didn't do it, someone else was going to do it. So it really was that fear of missing out. But, you know, how do you kind of help guide players to kind of figure out like to tell them like what is that spot like what is that best choice for them like how do you help them kind of figure out what that is that's a good question so and mike knows this about me and my wife is sitting next to me reading the book (laughs) i I think i'm always i'm always available like i tell people call me text me email me if if something's going on with your son have him contact me if he wants to talk to me have him call me uh, you know, I, and Jake and I talk about this. My job is to help guide people through this process. I don't think there's any family, you know, out in Baltimore or here that would say, you know, Chris doesn't get back to me in a timely fashion. Yeah. And my job is to get back to people and support their kids. And and you're, there are a couple of different roles I play with, with, at Country Day and at Juice Cherries. It's part, coach, teacher, advisor, therapist. You know, people call me and say, well. Well, my, my son's going through a very difficult time. His friends are committing. I said, well, that's good for your son's friends. Be happy for them, right? Be overjoyed for for them. And your son's experience could be totally different. You know, I'm, I was watching the Penn State game earlier. Dan Riom played at Brother Rice. He's got, the, I think he's double-digit goals for the season. And I've scrolled down their roster, and there are boys from Baltimore, played at elite, in, elite schools. He's playing better than they are. Yeah. He's – or he's he's on the second midfield line, and no one was recruiting. I think a couple schools recruited Danny. Great kid, good ball player. But you know, when I was in Baltimore, the kids that, on the roster at Penn State and other schools were really highly regarded, highly ranked. So none of that matters, you know. And I know you had Ty Zander, a very good friend of mine, on the podcast a while ago. And, and you know, Ty's rankings are phenomenal. He does a tremendous job. There's, there's no greater expert in recruiting in high school level than Ty. But he often says this too. People give him grief for his rankings, and he says, "It was my assessment at the time. Your son goes to school. Your daughter goes to school. They're with that coach, and that coach might not develop that player, or that player right. may get hurt. So, you know, it's like you got to find the right fit for your son. That may be at Division Three. You know, there was a kid at Michigan who transferred to Gettysburg, and that's the best fit for him. He didn't. I don't know the the exact story, right? But he left Division yeah. One to Division Three. It happened. So. You know, we always are there to talk to people and help them. But the reality is that is the most challenging, I think, part of the job I have. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah, I can I can only imagine. And, you know, I've talked to Ty many times over the years, and it's always like you're you're grading the player that they are at that point in time and not the player that they're going to be in three or four years. I mean, you, you mean it's easy to say hindsight, you know. Pat, you know, Pat Spencer would have been everyone's number one guy heading into college if you knew what he was going to be like by the time he was a senior. But it doesn't really work like that either. It's not a no. No one's Nostradamus, Nostradamus in this business either. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Pat, Pat Spencer and people have heard the story. That he was in the JV team at BL. He was actually on the Crabs B team. They call them the hard shells. They, used, they don't. They've come back a little bit, but it was like the feeder team for the Crabs. Were oh, we'll keep this kid. He's a BL kid. He may get a little bit better. He needs a place to play, <laughs> and then he got better. You know, and, and it can happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, why do you think that people? I'm not going to say look down, but like, why? Why is D1 considered like? the holy grail like held up like i have to go d1 like when you know and michael's made this point several times like you know look at tufts amherst like salisbury like oh these are like top schools like probably some could actually beat some d1 schools but why do people always see that as like uh you know that's maybe not not it's not held up in the same esteem i guess maybe is the the phrase i'm looking for yeah we, we talk about that a lot with kids and i said that before your college my friend is the head coach there they could beat a lot of Division One teams. RIT would handle easily a lot of Division One teams. Should just being on television, uh, all all of the I guess 
stuff kids think they get or the glamour that goes with it. And I tell kids all the time, Mike can attest to this. You know, he, I mean, a lot of these kids think, well, we'll be flying to games. No, you're not. <laughs> you're taking a bus just like everybody else. You're getting an eight dollar per diem just like everybody else. Probably got to give your helmet back in the spring just like everybody else. You know, you may get a couple of sticks, but ultimately, you know, you've got to figure out what's the best fit for you. And for some kids, I was talking to a former student who plays at Hopkins at St. Paul's about a friend of ours, and he's having a tough time at Division One school, and he may go play Division Three. He may just say, I- "I'm done. I want to go play." And you know, and we both said that probably was the best fit for him. Not that we know it all, but we had told him, "Hey, if you want to be the man." and play for a great program, go play somewhere where you can win a national championship and be a huge contributor as opposed to Division One level where they're recruiting your replacement every year. And that's the hardest thing to tell kids. The person that sits in your living room, calls you on the phone, makes you an offer, is looking for your replacement. Mm. That's hard. Yeah. Yeah, that, that would be a t- tough pill to swallow, I'm sure. <laughs> right, they and I know – and I know from a parent now coming from the parent side, and this is why I've seen coach Garland. And this is why I have hold him in such high esteem, his honesty. He's, he's, he's brutally honest and it gives him credibility. And, and I know that recently I had somebody who has uh, a kid talking to a division one school and his parent asked me, you know, is this a good fit? And, and I basically parroted everything that I heard from coach Garland saying, does your son wake up every day thinking about lacrosse, practicing lacrosse? Is that what he does? Does he love it? Does he love it? They're like, no, he comes home and he eats and he plays his video games. And I said, well, I don't think division one's going to fit him because it's that much of a time consuming thing. And a lot of parents, especially in the Midwest think division one, when they think division one, they think scholarships. They think yeah. like it's football or basketball. And I keep saying, you have no clue. Like it's not, it doesn't do that. And that's where the education part needs to come in for some parents. Um, and that's what I, no, I don't even want to bad mouth some other travel teams, but some promise the the, Oh, we can get you to D one. We can get you to D one. I've never heard of a travel program that gets you to a D one school. It's your work. It's whatever you do to get you there. Uh, but it's, it's, it, as, as coach Garland says, the, the importance as a parent I want whatever's greatest for my child. I don't, it's not my ego that I care about. Now, a lot of parents, it's their ego. It's their ego. Like I want my kid, I want to say my kid plays D1. I don't know how many times I've heard it. His kid plays D1. And I'm like, I don't, I don't care. Does he yeah. play? Does he play? You know, is he having a good time? College is about life. Of, it's only four years. So these are the important things in life. And it takes someone who has the honesty, like, like coach Garland to, let somebody know this, you know, that like if he said something to me, I'd trust it. And I know everyone who's been around him would trust what he said because he knows it. he has experience and he cares, truly cares about the kids in any program that he's in. And, and that's, I think that's rare to find actually. So yeah, I applaud coach Garland for that. Thanks. Yeah. You, uh, Michael, you brought up a, a interesting point because you said, parents parents in the midwest but garland you might have like you, you've seen both sides like you've seen the east coast like in the baltimore area and now you've seen a little bit out in the midwest like do you notice any kind of difference between the perception oh man oh <laughs> gosh oh uh, <laughs> you're allowed you're allowed to say no comment uh, yeah. okay <laughs> so you know um man in in baltimore it is, it is a pressure cooker for parents. And I was having a conversation with a mother. Her son plays for us. I taught him at Gilman. He played for me, and he stuck with me. He's going to play at Lehigh, Quinn Armstrong, one of the better players in the country at his position. And he was going through this process. The family was going through this process. And she said, we are not the, the mirror sticker people. And I think in that town and in a lot of other towns, it's the what sticker can we have on the back of our car to make us look really good. Now, this is a broad generalization of the area, and I shouldn't really say that. It can be unfair to some really good people there who care about their kids and want the best fit for their kids, but I think oftentimes I would hear that, right? Well, we want this. Well, it may not be the best fit for your kid, and well, this kid or these kids in this team are committing here, and you know, I'm glad the recruiting changes have come into play, and they've helped a lot of kids. So there, it is very different, and the stakes are 
unfortunately higher. I don't I don't know why they're higher. Uh, I just think it was for me. It was more. I didn't. I didn't. I loved coaching, but it, my wife would always tell you when the season started, I would be in a foul mood because I just didn't look <laughs> forward to it. I looked forward to the, the summer. The spring was such a drag. You know, it was just, and you know, it was hard. Uh, so, <laughs> yes, it was very different. Very different. Yeah, I yeah. mean, being being back there and having That's, talked it up, I I can just imagine. Like, I I could tell a difference that you know definitely is there is more pressure. And I think there is a lot of that fear of missing out, and you know, and again, like, there's no blanket statement that covers everybody. There's sure someone listening to this be like, well, right. I like that. Like, it's not one of those things. It's it's everybody, but you know, and I think probably it's the case too. Like, there's so many schools in the on the East Coast in the Baltimore area that you know it just kind of becomes. I think it's a little bit more. Um, you see it every day a little bit more. Like lacrosse yeah. is much more of a religion back in the Baltimore area than it probably is in the Midwest. Like you know, probably more like basketball in Indiana. And that yeah. that that you know, if you had to equate it to something like that's probably more what it's like East Coast. So they're there, and there's more kids going. I mean, it's very mm. rare that you see uh, MIA team that's not just littered with the future Division One players. So I can imagine how it probably is. It's easy to get kind of caught up in that in that race of where am I going? Where are we going? And obviously the kids were committing earlier and earlier, so they were trying to make that decision earlier and earlier as well. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, I always found, too, that the other teams that had a lot of committed kids, you know, it would be, well, that's where you want to go if you want to get recruited, and if you don't want to go there because they're not being recruited, the coach doesn't help. When that was never really the case, you know, that was, that was, that was the hardest part about coaching there. That was challenging. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Rat I, race, you know, it was a yeah, rat race. I definitely heard that as well many, many times. So, um, and you you kind of mentioned the recruiting timeline. I don't know. Do you have a thought on? Because Michael and I discussed it uh, last week, and we actually got a couple parents that kind of chimed in based on our the podcast that just came out yesterday. Do you have any thoughts on the NCAA potentially moving that recruiting window up or the contact window up to June or not to June? Sorry, to no, yeah, yeah June fifteenth, yeah, June from September, oh, man. Yeah. Interesting. I don't. Let me think about if I like that or not. June fifteenth feels earlier to, to me than I think I want. I would want it to be. You know, I, I would want kids to play at a few events. I would want kids to be able to take a look at schools informally. I would want kids to be able to play out the summer. If you think, if you move it up, right? If you yeah. move that, that date up. You know, it gives people who have money advantages over the others to be able to take kids. And I've always said this, and Ty and I have talked about this, you know, moving the timeline back has been a boon to the Ivies and to the fully funded programs, right? It's, it's helped them tremendously. I think we're seeing the end now where early recruiting has given us parity, which we all really love, and made the game really competitive. And now people aren't going to miss on kids anymore, yeah. You know, and you're not going to miss on an Asher Nolting. Like, you're not going to miss that guy. That's going to be a fully funded guy, a guy who gets money. He may, have, and I'm not, I don't know his circumstances, right? But that, that's a guy that's going to play it potentially. And I don't know his recruitment. And he, he, I would love to play for Coach Torpy, too. Who wouldn't? <laughs> but that may be a guy that doesn't fall through the cracks. And he didn't, he was higher ranked. People knew who he was. Yeah. Trevor Baptiste, Trevor Baptiste, right? Uh, he was a guy who was going to Franklin and Marshall until he was recruited by Denver. Yeah. So you're not going to see that happen anymore. Uh, and I think that's unfortunate. So yeah. part of me, purely recruiting, I like people making mistakes. I like parity. But now I think it's given people just a more peace of mind, which is good. I think it's yeah. good for kids. I think it's good for families. And it's good for club programs, too. The club programs that generally care about the interests of the kids. Yeah. Yeah, it was actually a parent. I won't mention their name, but they he, he kind of aired on, you know, kind of where Michael was like moving it up earlier, but he mentioned a good possible compromise, which I, I never thought about. And I kind of get your guys hot take on it is you can leave the recruiting window where it is, but if, and maybe this might go to your point as far as um, something else, but if you're on the campus of the college, like if you want to go like Michael, you mentioned like, Oh, you could drive over to Hopkins. If you guys are over there, go to Maryland. Like if you're on the campus, the coaches would then be at least allowed to ha talk with you. Cause you mentioned mm -hmm. that he was on campus with his son touring it but the coaches weren't allowed to speak to him at all which they found frustrating so i don't know if that kind of goes to your point like oh you know maybe 
families with money would have an advantage because they could make those trips versus somebody else. Like, I don't know if you guys have an opinion on that. You know, not that we're going to fix the NCAA, but you know. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Uh, that's, Michael, that's, I know you have an opinion. <laughs> right. Well, I, I've said when it, we're out in Baltimore for the month of June, and let's say I'm driving back home through Ohio, you know, and I say, let's stop at Baldwin Wallace. Let's stop at um, Ohio Wesleyan. And if you could talk to a coach without any problem, that would be, that would be cool, you know, to get the whole lay of the land. So I see where that, where you're saying the, uh, compromise is. I just feel as a, as a parent, now again, I'm not in that situation, but there are kids who are, you know, playing up at, with my son and different teams yeah. that are being looked at by big time schools. And I know that it's a lot of pressure for them. I know that there's kids who are. Parents are freaking out. So if they can get sort of a an answer that summer, that in June or whatever, or get, it it might help them a little bit. I mean, there's no right or wrong answer. There's just what I what I see with other parents. Um, yeah. when, this weekend, when we were standing on the sidelines yesterday, two parents came up to me and said, "I liked your argument better than Mike's argument. I like it <laughs> earlier. We're out there. I would like to know." And these were kids who these were guys who had. D one type parents, D D one type kids. So they weren't, yeah. and they were like, "Oh yeah, we're we're worried about it." So, you know, I guess I, I I'd I'd be curious to hear what the kids would say. Well, yeah, like, I mean, from that. like I guess I'm well, I'm I think about it more from the kids' perspective. Like, what what would they? Go ahead, Coach Garland. You Garland. know, it's funny. I think with the um, with September first of junior year. It puts a lot of emphasis on fall across, and fall across is bad. I mean, sometimes I go to these events, and I'm like, well, this is a waste of my weekend. What am I doing out here? The fields are terrible. Oh. Oh, right? yeah. You know, it's, it's really cold. It's unpleasant. The teams haven't practiced. You don't have guys there. You know, we got fortunate. We were in Long Island at a great event, a beautiful day, and then we ended up in Delaware at a great event. But the weather was bad. It was a tremendous event. It helped our guys a lot, but the fields were in terrible shape. So let's say, you know, you're a fast kid, you know, you're a great athlete, quick twitch kid, and you're playing in a bad field. It's like, well, got to wait to see this kid until the summertime. So what's yeah. the point, right? It's hard to really evaluate kids in the fall. You know, you're only following up on kids who you watched in the summertime, which leads me kind of to the point I wanted to make to people who listen and you guys you know, if you're playing for, and we try to do this, and I think about this intently all the time, okay, how are we preparing you to be ready for the summer? What are we doing? Right? Have you done well in school? Do I have your transcript? Do you have a video highlight? Have we reached out to schools? Have we created a list for you? Have you been proactive? And then do I do my job? When you give me all that, we create your list. I call these guys and say, you know, your John Jacob Jingerheimer Schmidt is going to be here, here, and here. Can you watch and play? You got it, Chris. No problem. And then I follow up with those people. And then if they say, we don't like them, move on. Right? And we go back to the list. So I'm in yeah. touch with people all summer about this. this is the, it's the sole focus of the summer for me. That's yeah. it. That's what I do. You know? Yeah. So that's I think if programs aren't doing that, it seems like, well, what are you paying these people for? Right. What are you doing for the privilege of going to events? Like, that seems <laughs> silly to me. You yeah. know? And Mike, we had, and we're really proud of this. You know, 33 of 38 of our kids are playing college lacrosse. That's 87 percent. And the wow. one kid going to West Point, one kid's going to Notre Dame. Both those kids may walk on. One kid's still waiting here from a D2 school. One kid, I think he received an offer from a Division one school. He was unsure about it, and then one of the kid fell off the map, which happens. It just yeah. ha it happened. So, of the, the 38 kids, I've been in touch with all of them, and. We found a great home for them together, so that's that for us is really successful, and the yeah. kids deserve credit. So they've they've listened. Yeah, um, I kind of want to move a little bit off the field, and because I know we always talk about you know the recruiting period and summer and fall and the lacrosse and stuff like that, but what else can a kid be doing to make them recruitable from that doesn't happen on the field? So when I tell this to the folks at a recruiting presentation, I would rather you spend you know, 600 bucks on an ACT, SAT prep course in a prospect day. I would rather you spend money on a tutor in calculus than going to a prospect day. Like that doesn't seem like money well spent. We talk about our return on investment. That's where you get the greatest return on investment, doing well in school. Yeah. And the thing I think yeah. people miss out on is just 
and we talk about this a lot at the presentation we give, you know, you have to make a difference in your school. If you're just a guy or a girl who does well, like you're, you're no different than anyone else of the 50,000 or so kids playing and what makes you unique? What, how have you made a difference? So we talk to kids about that, you know, being, being members of their community. Uh, the other thing too, you got to get stronger. You got to be in the weight room. And, you know, if you're playing college lacrosse, something you want to do, you got to invest time in it. It's just not something that's going to happen if you wave a magic wand. So it's got to be something you really work at every day. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Michael, you got anything for Coach Garland before we move on to our next topic? Oh, no, I, I knew I'm, I second every single thing he says. I mean, it's, it's right on the money. Uh, I mean, like when I talked to Casey D'Andolfo from Tufts, mm-hmm. and I said to him, What's the number one thing you look for in a recruit? I'm like, is it speed? Is it size? Is it athleticism? And he said, grades. He said, because none of the other stuff matters if I can't get you into school. Yeah. And when I said that and I wrote about it and we talked about it, people were shocked. They were shocked. They're like, what do you mean? I said, there's an unbelievable school with an unbelievable program. And the very first thing he says is grades. So I loved that that opened a lot of people's eyes. And I love that that's the thing because it is the grades. It is about school. Yeah. No matter what, it's about school. You're not going to go play 15 years of lacrosse and become a multimillionaire. It's not happening. It, there's no such thing. I mean, it's so get that, have fun, get the education, and then work to what your career might be based on what you did at school. And, and as we saw today, there's fewer opportunities in professional lacrosse than there were yesterday. Yeah. Yes. Assuming that's not an April Fool's Day joke. This We are recording this on April Fool's. I, I keep waiting for the April Fool's for Major League Lacrosse on that. But... Yeah, I, I don't think it's happening. <laughs> and, and in light of kind of the, this uh, college, college scandal, I think it's going to be more challenging to get into some of these selective schools. You know, yeah. I think they may be, I think we're, we're going to see more schools that are test optional. And I, I've spoken to people about, well, what, what's the, what's the, how is this going to change admissions? Or you may present a body of work. They may make it the bar so high to apply to these schools, right? That it's going to be a deterrent for people, right? Where interviews are required on campus. Show me your portfolio. What have you done over the last four years? People getting rid of the common app. That, that may be what changes things. Granted, I don't think schools will do that. They like the, they like the revenue. So we'll see. There's something big in. Yeah, it's it's coming. A, ch- a change, you all got to know, a, ch- a change is coming. A change is coming. I don't know what it's going to look like. I get a sense of that, and if I hear more about it, I'll certainly be able to tell you, you yeah. know? Yeah. yeah, I agree with you. Okay. All right, well, you know, I know we kind of went, obviously, you – being both well i guess all three of us are located in the midwest probably several just only a few hours apart um but i know michael has you know covers most of the midwest but coach garland i'd like to get, get your sense of you know what's it what's your take on like the kind of the midwest lacrosse scene so far oh i think i think brother rice is very good they're playing with a bit of a chip on their shoulders uh they're they're very good on defense james donaldson is tremendous uh, Mason Everly is very, he's, he, he committed to Rutgers. He's very good. Uh, they're deep. Justin Glad at attack, Michael Cosgrove. Uh, that, that's just a team that's going to be reckoned with. They're, they're playing angry and they want to, they want to absolutely pummel people this year and leave no doubt about how good they are. And they, and they beat, they beat CC pretty handily. Um, with that being said, uh, I think Heartland is going to give them a run for their money. I think Heartland's got enough. We scrimmage Heartland Country Day, and I said to some folks, that's that's a good – I vote for them every week in the inside lacrosse poll because I think they're very good. Uh, they're good on defense. They're very good at attack. Uh, the Plemons brothers, uh, uh, Reese Potter, uh, like Trevor Lockwood is going to Lindenwood. Uh, they have a good goalie. They've got a good faceoff, and they've got enough athletes. Kieran Velasquez, who is, I think, guys, going to absolutely blow up this summer. Um He's, he's like 6'2", 190, can run like a deer. He's a guy no one's heard of. He plays for the Cherries, but plays for Heartland. He's a new kid to our program. He's exceptional. So I think they're going to be very good. I think they're going to be in the finals. I, I mean, I don't want to say they're going to be CC or, or Rice, but I think they'll be there at the end. So that's, that's sort of how I think things in the state are. F4 still Central is very good. CC, Heartland, Brother Rice. Those are, the best. I think, the best four teams in the state. Rochester Adams, when we played, 
they're pretty good. They got Will Ronan, who's going to Brian. He played for me. He's a great kid. I think he had eight points against us. They're looking really good. So yeah. in Michigan, it's a bit top heavy, but there's talented kids all over the state. So that's sort of what I see or what I've seen right now. Yeah. Okay. All right, Michael. It's guys. You're, you you laughed whenever he mentioned Brother Rice and beating up on people. I know you saw, you saw you got to see them. You kind of echo that statement as well. Uh, you know, oh, it, yeah. I've I, I've 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 gone out of my way to like warn people who are about to play him. <laughs> I said you better be ready because the way they jumped out on on Catholic Central, it, it and again their defense. It looks like you're playing against college players. I mean, they're big, they're strong, they're fast, and they have a chip on their shoulder. Now, I'm going up there again this uh, this weekend because New Trier, one of the Illinois top teams, will be playing against Catholic Central at University of Michigan on Friday, and or no, on Saturday. And on Sunday, New Trier plays Brother Rice. And I just said, I, I said to the coach, I said, this is... um. You're going to need to tighten up because I, I seriously think they want to try to make an example of people. I mean, yeah. they were so fired up after their victory against Catholic Central. Like, I thought it might have gotten a little too overboard, like parents getting too crazy. And I'm like, hey, it's just one game. And, you know, it, it, it's but this is might be too, too hyped up, but they're ready to go. So I would be I would be afraid if there's one team that would scare me in the Midwest to play right now. It would be Brother Rice. They're deep. Yeah. I, I, they, I, if you could put them. I said this to someone. If they play in the MIA, that that's a third or fourth place team. That's a third or fourth place team. There you go. Yeah, that's a, that's a uh, pretty. I mean, and, and now on a Tuesday, Brother Rice, James Donaldson could cover anyone in the country. He could neutralize any attackman. Uh, they're pretty good. I mean, on defense, they're pretty good. And Justin Glad can score on just about anybody. He's pretty slick, so they could play with this. I mean, the only team I could see them, you know, like they'd give McDonough a game. They give Boys Latin. They'd, I think they'd beat Boys Latin. They yeah. beat them. And I, I think like anybody listening to that might think that's my. I guess I could see how they think it'd be a weird statement to say like they're a third place team. But when you consider an unranked St. Paul's team just knocked off the number one team in the country, right. McDonough, like you start to see like how crazy that conference is from top to bottom when it truly is like any given day any of those teams can beat the other one and they they all know it like i remember years ago i don't know if you were there when they used to play the teams used to play each other twice in the regular season that was and, before, oh man yeah, me. I, I i've talked to a couple guys that did that and they were like they hated it because it was so much pressure because like you, it's so hard to beat those teams it's hard to beat them twice in a season nonetheless and not you know then you have the potential of playing them three times because you were playing them in two in the regular season and one possibly in the playoffs. Like, it was nuts. So, I mean, teams would – it made going undefeated virtually impossible. Like, you and had my, to be a next level. <laughs> my second year, we played Boys Latin, and they were very good. Matt Brandau, Chris Brandau. Yep. I mean, Matt Brandau was doing well at Yale. We beat them, and we didn't make the playoffs. Yeah. <laughs> we beat them. And I mean that was an unbelievable win, great win for the kids, but that's how it is. Like you're yeah. absolutely right, Mike. Anybody can beat anybody, but Brother Rice would give people a run for their money in that league. I know that they got enough talent. They're well coached. Uh, if they were to play the way they did against CC, you know, they beat Loyola Blakefield. They got more talent than Loyola Blakefield. Brother Rice has more talent than they do. Yeah. You know, I know that. I've coached a lot of the kids in Brother Rice's team. Um, they're they're not as good as I think some of those teams at the face off position, but they're pretty good. Still, a really good team. All right. Well, I want to give you a minute before we let you go and get back to your wife for the evening. Um, you know, we want to talk to you about your team. Obviously, we've talked yeah. about a lot of other stuff. Like, tell us a little bit about uh, Country Day for this season. Great, great group of kids. We're two and two right now. We lost to Shaker Heights in triple overtime our first game. We're in it. We're youthful. We have two seniors, uh, but we, we played better and we beat our rival Cranbrook eight to two. Tremendous defensive effort. Uh, we have a game against Saline this week. We play uh, o uh, Orchard Lake St. Mary's and then Brother Rice next week. Uh, excited about the group of kids. We're very good on defense. Ryan Linklip, a freshman defenseman starter. Sam Urjavac, a sophomore defenseman starter. Connor Sims, a sophomore defensive starter. Those are all collegiate lacrosse players playing at a very high level. Nathan Marsden, Mitty, Carl, uh, and uh, Max Zimmerman are two seniors, tremendous leaders. And we've got some. We got uh, one. One of my favorite kids, uh, Luke Soup Bernard, uh, has just shown tremendous grit and determination. And this has been the key to our success, guys. Joe Miller, twenty-one face-off guy. 
I think he could be one of the best face-off guys in the state. He's winning out a 70% clip. He's been very good for us. So defense, riding, and winning face-off has kept us in games and been competitive. But we're getting more experience. Two seniors. Uh, and, you know, when I took the job over at Country there was just some transition guys like, hey, you know, I'm a hockey guy. I'm a senior. I don't want to do it anymore. We got that. We understand that. And, you know, for us, we want guys who want to be there and want to compete without complaint and love their teammates and want to be committed to what we're trying to do at Country Day. So that's what I'm really excited about. we got a great group of kids, and we're playing very hard. So I'm, I love the team. I've got a tremendous coaching staff, and we have all the resources we need to get really good. All right. And if anybody wants to follow you guys during the season, are you guys on, on Twitter, Instagram? Like, where can people kind of follow you guys? Yeah, uh, at DCDS Lacrosse and Coach Garland1. Twitter, that's me. Follow me. I follow the team. Uh, probably unfollow me if you don't like the Jets or Knicks, <laughs> but whatever. I don't care. Unfollow me. Unfollow me. <laughs> and the Mets. No one wants to hear about the Mets, but I don't care. You don't like those teams? Don't follow me. <laughs> there you go. You got to you gotta either follow it for everything or for nothing, right? <laughs> like, mute, take... mute me. Yeah, there you go. All right, Coach. Well, I can't thank you enough, and good luck for the rest of your season. Thank you for being on this week. Thanks, guys. Take care. All right. Thank you, Coach. All right, everyone, that's going to do it for episode 60 of the Around the Crease podcast. I hope you really enjoyed that. If you have any comments, please try to find us on social media. I am at Lax Records on Twitter and Instagram, Facebook, and you can find Michael Ward at MFWCHI on Twitter. And, of course, you heard Coach Garland at DCDS Lacrosse on Twitter. So find us wherever you want. We'd love to hear what you think about the show and what you hear about the recruiting options in general. If you're listening to this on iTunes or whatever your podcast player of choice is, do us a quick favor and actually leave us a review we are told that that actually will help the show and bring it to a broader audience and if you're watching this on youtube please hit that like button and please hit subscribe everybody have a week